This episode discusses hate crimes, homicide, and autopsy. Listener discretion is advised. This is The Fall Line. In early 2021, we covered our first national case, the unsolved 1996 murder of Juan Leon Lorellis, better known to his friends and family as Leon. We were contacted by his niece, Arlene, and her request was the reason that we decided to expand beyond the Southeast. New listeners can find a link to our original coverage in our show notes, but we'll share some of what we said then about Leon's case. Leon lived and worked in Brown County, in the west central area of the state. Brown County is home to less than 40,000 people. At the time of his death, Leon Lorellis was living in one of those little towns, in Banks, with his older brother George. Leon was 30 years old and working the graveyard shift at a local Kroger grocery store. He was a well-loved, punctual, and trustworthy employee who always showed up for his shifts. On the night of May 10, 1996, he was due at the store at 12 a.m. According to his family, he left his brother George's house at about 11.30 p.m. Per the Brownwood Bulletin, Leon lived just about six miles west of the Kroger. The drive should have taken no longer than 15 minutes. And Leon did make it to Kroger, at least according to his co-workers, who saw his car outside. It was a distinctive vehicle, a 1988 Ford Thunderbird, which employees had spotted sitting outside in the parking lot. But Leon never walked inside. And soon, though no one is quite sure when it happened, his car disappeared from that Kroger lot, with Leon's 12 a.m. shift time passing without his arrival. By 12.30 a.m., Leon's 1988 Ford Thunderbird would be spotted by motorists, four miles away. According to the Abilene Reporter News, the car sat off the side of a rural road near a gun range. It had been set ablaze. When local firefighters arrived on scene, they discovered Leon's body. He was lying on the ground not far from the vehicle, near a fence that ran in front of the gun range. He had been shot once, quote, execution style. Witnesses reported seeing, quote, a white, flatbed, late-model truck near the scene. According to a Crime Stoppers bulletin released just after Leon's death, that same truck, which had a distinctive trailer hitch, had rolled along after Leon's Thunderbird, up the shoulder of the farm road. It wouldn't be long after that that Leon's car was set on fire, and his body would be found. That was May 10th, 1996. Leon's case has been unresolved for nearly 28 years. His name never made national headlines, but plenty of people in Brown County, they remember Leon's story. Some even think that they have a pretty good idea who might have committed the crime. Some in town think his death was the result of a hate crime, though it's never been formally labeled as such. Leon Lorellis, who was gay, lived in an area where local politicians and retired sports heroes reportedly felt comfortable using homophobic slurs on the local talk radio station KXYL. Leon had grown up a little way south, down in Brady, Texas. Leon was the youngest child in a big family. His brothers and sisters, they were much older. When he came along in 1966, those siblings were moving on to start their own families. Leon, he lived alone with his aging parents. And though his older brothers and sisters certainly helped out, he quickly took on the role of primary caregiver. According to his niece Arlene, nurturing was a natural inclination of Leon's. Arlene and Leon were only a few years apart in age, and they were raised more like cousins, or even brother and sister. When Arlene had her kids, Leon stepped in to help with childcare. That was his way. He spent most of his life giving, both the friends and family. But Leon was very private when it came to his personal life, and Arlene did not know a lot about how he spent his free time outside of work or who he might have been dating. It's information that she wished she had when news of his death came, and the investigation seemed to stall almost as soon as it began. When we first covered Leon's case, 
We reached out to local law enforcement and we filed a FOIA, but we were denied on both counts. There was a little media coverage from the 1990s that we could use in our original reporting. Not much, but a little. But most of our story centered on Arlene and other family members' recollections and their frustrations that Leon's case had gone cold and remained so for so many years. They had many questions that had never been answered regarding Leon's car, his autopsy, investigation into rumors and possible suspects in town, and whether Leon had been killed simply because he was gay. Three years have passed since our initial broadcast. So I sat down with Arlene to discuss what's happened since we released our initial episode covering Leon and what she needs from our listeners today. So as I mentioned, I know that we were the first podcast you appeared on. So talk to me about what happened next. How many podcasts has Leon's story been on since? And what have you learned about telling his story in that medium of podcasting? How has your experience been? Since we spoke the first time, there has been so much that has happened very quickly. I was reaching out to so many different podcasters, and I got a good response back. Leon's story has been featured in 20 different podcasts. I've been very fortunate to connect with some amazing people And I'm proud of how they have told Leon's story. So my experience with them has gone very well. I don't really have anything to complain about, but I know I'm one of the lucky ones. Some haven't been as lucky, but I have. Some of those people have stayed in contact with me or still supporting me and they are friends and like family to me now. So that has been very helpful. So Gone Cold was the second podcast I did after the fall line. He is so incredibly kind, patient, and empathetic. I was able to open up a little more with him. He's also a great researcher and was able to get in contact with a few people that Leon had been speaking with the last few weeks of his life. So that was extremely helpful. Vincent and I have remained in contact. He continues to support me and help me in any way he can. He's one of my biggest supporters in every way. He just attended our march in Brownwood and has attended the last few memorials. And I am incredibly grateful to him. I'm so grateful to just meet so many amazing people. And they have helped me in many, many different ways with connecting me with other people, people to help me make postcards and flyers and news press release, also with other things such as the t-shirts we made. I can't even remember all of it, but they have helped me in so many different ways. So I know there's been some various efforts to get files and official information in Leon's case. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, Vincent was able to get me in contact with a lot of the people that Leon was in contact right before his death. So I have been able to communicate with them and find out what they know. And also gave me an insight into what Leon was like with them during that time. I've also been working with Uncovered a lot and they have retrieved Lots of other information. Um, I don't know that I can share all of it yet, but information about the suspects, about what was happening during that time in Brownwood. We've also retrieved um, some names that we have spoken to, and they have been able to give me some more information on who and why this happened. I know a big struggle, even when we started, was just trying to get any kind of FOIA fulfilled in Leon's case. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I know that's been a big struggle with everyone you've worked with intensively afterward, and now a struggle for you. So I'd love for you to talk about what you have finally been able to get officially in his case from official sources. Getting the FOIA request answered and getting an autopsy has been my biggest struggle from day one. And I know that a lot of My friends and podcasters have also sent FOIA requests without any response. So when I reached out this last time, a couple of years ago, I was advised to contact Judge Hurt in Brownwood. So I reached out to him 
he told his assistant to tell me to call the sheriff. So I called there, spoke to the records keeper who told me that she knows Leon's case because they had pulled it out in the past. She also said that the records were in a box in the basement and that it wasn't digitized. So she had me fill out an official form for the request. I did that. And all I received was a two-sentence press release from 2017. So I called the DA, Michael Murray, and he said to me, quote, why do you need the autopsy when we all know what his demise was? End of quote. So I contacted Travis County Medical Examiner, and they also referred me to Judge Hart. A few weeks later, we received a page and a half of an autopsy, which happens to be just the basic info, what Leon weighed, how tall he was, you know, mentioning the weight and color of his organs. And there was a part that said the toxicology report was negative. So, I mean, that was helpful. It's just a couple of pages out of a much larger report. Um, So I can't see any medical examiner or deputy sheriff's signatures on the page. So I don't know what the full autopsy is. So based on what you saw, did it raise any new questions for you? There's a lot more there that I need to know. I need to know if there's other injuries to Leon's body. I need to know if, did he fight back? Was there anything under his fingernails, any injuries that he had other than the gunshot wound? And I feel like there's no real reason for them to keep that information from me. Um, It has been almost 28 years. So, Have you been able to find out any more about what evidence is still available today in Leon's case for testing or the possibility of testing? Those are exactly the questions I keep asking and the reason why I want the autopsy. I did ask the deputy at the sheriff's department if they had anything that could be tested. Did they have his clothing? Did they have fingernail clippings? Anything that can be tested with with the advancements in technology today, her response to me was, we have done everything with what we have. So to me, I'm just assuming that they didn't keep much evidence. So there isn't anything to test. And probably also, that is the reason why they don't want to give me the full autopsy, because they are hiding something. You just would really like to get some clarity on those issues. Absolutely. That's all I'm asking for. So speaking of clarity, I know that last summer you actually got some really unexpected information. And you mentioned a PI a little earlier. And I would love for you to talk about the information that you unexpectedly came upon in relation to that private investigator. Our listeners may remember that initially you thought that the private investigator that you hired in the case hadn't really found anything. But to my understanding, you've actually discovered that not to be true. Can you talk about that? Yes, that's exactly what I've always assumed about the private investigator that my Uncle George and I hired. He came as highly recommended and was very well known and lived in Dallas. And so we thought, okay, this is perfect. We can finally get some answers. And we started to have some hope there. But the reason we hired the investigator was because the Texas Ranger who was in charge of Leon's case didn't really do any investigation. My uncle kept going to him, asking him for updates. And like two weeks later, what he pulled out was two little pieces of paper kind of like sticky notes. And that was his total investigation on Leon's case. So my uncle came to me and we decided we needed outside help. And we hired this investigator. He was there a couple of weeks and he informed us that he had been threatened and that there was a lot of corruption in Brown County. So he was not going to continue with the investigation and he left. I always assumed he didn't give any of his notes to us. But this summer, 
my uncle was interviewed by some investigators that were helping me. He informed them that he did have notes. They are actually these huge poster boards that is so 80s, right? Or 90s. So he gave them to him and my uncle had put them away in a closet and never pulled them out again, never looked at them, never even told me that he had these. And so when he admitted he did have them, he handed them over. They brought those to me. It was a lot of emotions going on in my mind. Some that I can't even explain. It was kind of like an out-of-body experience. Like I looked at them and all the hurt and trauma and my heartbreaking just all came back to me full force like if it was in 1996. I was just staring without even blinking. There were people trying to talk to me and explain things to me, but it sounded like they were so far away and I couldn't really understand what they were saying to me. And I just, I couldn't cope. So I just left the room and we came home. I put them in my guest closet and could not bring myself to look at them. And that's when I totally understood exactly why my uncle did what he did, because I was doing the same thing. We just couldn't handle it. So it took me a couple of months to gather up strength emotionally and physically. And I decided this is not for me. It means so much to me that people know what happened to Leon to know that his murderers are living free in the same town almost 28 years later. And they took everything away from Leon and from those of us that love Leon. It's not fair. And Leon matters. So I finally got the strength to pull them out of the closet, look at them. I shared some of the photos on Facebook um, just to make people aware of what is happening here. It's not just one person that's affected when they're taken. It is a whole family, a whole community, friends, coworkers that are truly affected by what this one person did. And I have to be Leon's voice. As painful and difficult as it is for me, I have to be strong for Leon. So... This is the only reason I was able to pull them out and finally look at them because it's not about me. It's about Leon. I think that before we talk about a little bit of the information that you received, it's really important to take a second to stress that point you just made, that when you got information that you really needed, you couldn't process it right away. And you really understood why your Uncle George had to put it in the closet. I think that's something listeners need to think about. Because as much as families want and need this information, getting it can be incredibly shocking and traumatic. This information that you had no idea existed. And it was too much to process. I mean, a literal presentation of information. Yeah. Stuff you had been fighting and digging for for several years. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of putting it away, to you, the idea maybe that your Uncle George had at first was strange, but it made total sense because you needed that time to think and to Mm -hmm. process to heal because that's a traumatic situation in and of itself. Not knowing is traumatic and then finding something else is traumatic too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just like you said, I have been looking and waiting for this information for so long. I was desperately needing it. And when it was there, like you said, I just, I couldn't process it. Even though I know full, fully everything that happened to Leon, I know this. And I've, you know, pictured in my mind for 27 years, looking at it was a totally different experience that I can't even put into words. It was just like everything was just crashing on me and I couldn't process it. And that's why I had to put it away. And then I completely understood exactly what my uncle felt and what he was going through and how difficult this was for him. So it took me a couple of months, but I knew I had to for Leon. 
And when you were able to actually take a look at this information, based on what you told me before, you had some pictures of his car. There were some names of suspects, and we won't get specific there, but also some timeline events, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of that information, let's start with the timeline events. Is there anything specific you want to highlight there that you think it's particularly important for people to know? So the PI went back as far as a few months with people that Leon interacted with, who he was hanging out with up until his death. I was already aware of all but one person. He then went on to list the rumors that were going around at the time about why Leon was killed. The rumors that were going around there at the time were nowhere near anything that was remotely true but he did mention them. The PI didn't put much value on them either, but he did also list some reasons as to why Leon was murdered. These notes of his had three suspects that were the same people that I have always suspected, and the same person that many local people told me that they had heard that person bragging about killing Leon at parties So that was not a surprise to me, but there was another name listed on there that I had not heard of, and I did not know there was any connection to Leon. So we did a little research on him, and I'm quite sure the PI was correct on his, this name being on the list. So I know one of the things that you received were, as I mentioned, photos of Leon's car. And that was one of the first things that I saw you post on social media, I think actually on Instagram. And you were really particularly trying to get some feedback from your friends and colleagues about a couple of things. But one thing I remember specifically was the position of Leon's car seat. And I think it was really based on whether or not, whether or not it was adjusted for Leon's height. Am I correct in remembering that? Yes. I feel like if they had kept the burned car or taken better photographs, that we could learn who actually was driving the car that night. Because I can't tell from these photos if the driver's seat is in a position of a normal person's height or if it was reclined all the way back and pushed all the way back as Leon always had it when he drove the car. I've always assumed he was super tall because I always have to look up to him. But what I did find out is is he was 5'10", and I always thought he was six feet. I know, stupid. (laughs) Because he was like, just not like, he was big and the way he was built, but he was also a little overweight. So he always kept his car seat pushed all the way back and reclined as far back as it could to drive. And that's why I feel like knowing the position of the driver's seat that we could learn who was driving Leon's car and which also would prove that he was actually kidnapped from the Kroger parking lot and he didn't just drive himself there. And I know that we've spoken before, but you would like to get these pictures reviewed by someone. So if we do have any experts out there who'd like to volunteer their time, do get in contact. Yes, I would really appreciate that. One thing we discussed several years ago was the possibility that Leon's death was a hate crime. Can you talk about your current view on that based on the new information that you have? I have always believed that it was a hate crime. And in fact, several years ago, the Texas Ranger that was in charge of investigating Leon's case was quoted in a newspaper saying he believed it was a hate crime. I believe that was in 2009. And I do remember reading the article, showing the article to a few people. So have you been able to find any resources to help you based on that information that Leon's death may have been a hate crime? What is it you need from law enforcement and other officials that you aren't getting now? No, I have not gotten any information. So the sheriff himself now has said that he will not release any information to me. So I haven't been able to get any help at all. 
Have they told you that the case is active? His words were that it was an ongoing investigation. So what are your current goals in Leon's case? My current goal, right, is to find an attorney to help me obtain the autopsy and any relative information that will not interfere with the case. I need help getting media attention willing to spotlight Leon's case. I have a petition going on right now to get Leon's case reviewed with fresh eyes, hopefully to get the FBI involved. As in my opinion, this is a hate crime on different levels. He was kidnapped, a Hispanic gay man, and it fits the qualifications as a hate crime. So anyone that could help me with any of those things would be greatly appreciated. And I do want to point out to our audience that Arlene has been raising money for years to try and pay for an attorney, but really I think she's raised what she can. So I'd like to invite our audience to share ideas regarding possible legal resources. She's going to share some contact information at the end of the show, and she's looking particularly for legal clinics, nonprofits, and similar programs. So Arlene, based on what you've been doing now, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about awareness campaigns that you've been involved in. So tell us about the billboard first. The billboard was for a full year, and it was sponsored by Season of Justice. Kendall is an amazing person. She helped me get the grant for that billboard, and I am eternally grateful to her. Um, Also, I have been on an ethical true crime panel discussion with the True Crime Podcast Festival in 2023 with Haley Gray, who's a true crime researcher and the co-founder of True Crime Podcast Training. I will also be with her on the panel again this year at the True Crime Podcast Festival. I was also on a panel hosted by Uncovered with the founder, Jim Brown, and also the founder of Project Cold Case, Ryan Backman, Sarah Attorney of Voices for Justice, and Delia D'Ambrose, Aaron of Generation Y podcast. We're all on the panel. We discussed various ways to keep the podcast ethical when telling these stories and speaking with families. And you've also hosted several events for Leon. I know you just had one this past weekend, which I'll get you to talk about in a second. But I think one thing that's particularly important is to mention that there has been a reward for the past year in this case, right? For $30,000. Yes. Last year at Leon's Memorial, someone donated $30,000 as a reward for information on Leon's case. It does have the end date, which will end this May. So I'm hoping that someone will come forward then. I have gotten tips from it, but not anything concrete as such as evidence that I can use. But I am grateful for anyone that has reached out to me. And I know that is a substantial reward. So is your feeling that people still after 28 years are just afraid to talk? That is absolutely 100% what is happening there. And speaking of events, I know that you just held one this past weekend. It won't be the past weekend for our listeners, but for you and me, it was this past weekend. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I held a march in Brownwood, Texas to bring awareness not only to Leon's case, but there are four other homicide victims where their cases are cold up to 40 years now. And I wanted to bring a light to all these cases in Brownwood. And I wanted to invite the community and the family members of those other homicide cases to participate and to demand justice and just to have our voices heard. I didn't get as great of a turnout as I was expecting, but I feel like It did some good, and I'm hoping that next year will be even better. And my hope is to eventually include other Texas cases, not just in Brownwood. And I want to just build a community where we can share resources, encourage others, or just be there for someone if they want to cry or vent or talk. And that's what my goal is. One thing I wanted to mention is a lot of times listeners or people who've read my book ask me how they can be helpful in cold cases. This is one of the ways that you can be helpful in cold cases. 
not only attending events like Arlene's when you see them advertised, especially if they're in your area, showing up and being someone who is there to be supportive is incredibly helpful, but also helping with the organizing of these events and taking some of the pressure off family members who are not only there for their loved one's cold case, but they're also organizing the entire event. They're worrying if people are going to show up. I don't know if you can understand the pressure of that. Worrying if someone's going to show up to the event for your loved one who has a cold case. Brooke and I were just at an event a couple of weeks ago where a lot of family members weren't able to make it because of transportation and weather, offering to pay for an Uber for a family member who wouldn't be able to attend otherwise. Reaching out to someone like Arlene who's organizing the event and saying, how can I help? Do you need money for supplies? Do you need people to show up with posters? Uh, do you need people to volunteer to help with childcare for folks? who wouldn't otherwise be able to come. There are so many ways that you can help in large and small ways to make these events smoother for families. But the easiest way is to be a person who's there and just be there. And I mean, Arlene, would you agree that that is the simplest thing somebody can do? 100%. And mostly, you know, I just want people to show up. Even if you're there for just 15 minutes, it really, really matters to us. Because not only does it show us that our loved one is still matters, that they're remembered, but you're supporting other families as well. And just, you know, sharing the event, showing up. We had a podcast that donated water for us because those things are costly. I like to make people feel invited and welcomed and comfortable. And so I always provide water and snacks and those things become costly that people may not be aware of. So just anything you can do to help is, is a tremendous, you know, way to help and puts a little pressure off of us. That's an incredibly good point too, because that didn't even occur to me that outside of the cost of things like signs, et cetera, that you need water and you need some snacks for people. Of course you need water. It's Texas. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So that makes perfect sense. I do want to mention that we've been talking a lot about podcasts here, and I may have buried the lead a little bit in that we've told our audience a few times that you have a podcast at the end of our podcast, but I want to talk a little bit about your podcast now, and I want you to tell folks first the name of your podcast, why it's called that, why you started it, what you've covered so far, and you know what your hopes are for that podcast. So my podcast is called Box in the Basement. The reason I decided on this name is because in my head, I have always pictured Leon's case files in a ragged old dusty box in the basement. I was even told it was in the basement. So that's why I came up with this name. When I first pitched the idea, they looked at me a little strange. But once I explained why I felt this was the appropriate name, they all agreed because you know, most boxes are actually in the basement. The basement is where these cases go to just die. All hope dies there if they're never pulled out. And that's what I want to do. Pull these boxes out, share those stories that people have forgotten about, and hopefully bring attention enough to where someone would be willing to look into the case again and hopefully bring some closure, some adjustment some justice for those people. So along this journey, it became more than just Leon. It was bigger. I needed to help all the people in Brownwood. And then I needed to help all the other people because I know exactly what their families are going through, what they feel, how hopeless and defeated they feel at times because law enforcement doesn't communicate. They have forgotten the case completely. And these families are forgotten as well. And I am here to be their voice and to show them support and bring those cases back to light. And that is my purpose here. How has it been for you to be the podcaster versus the interview subject? Has that changed your perspective? A little bit. I feel like I have an advantage because I am a family member. I am an advocate. And I know how I felt being interviewed and what questions 
I do not like, what questions I do want to be asked, and how to be empathetic towards them because I can't understand where they're at. So I think it's been, I'm not going to say easy, but it's been been encouraging to be able to understand both sides. Has law enforcement been willing to participate in any of these cases or fulfill FOIA for any of these cases you've covered so far? No. In all of the cases that are in Broward right now, they have not received FOIA or autopsy reports at all either. And so there's a problem here. And that's what I'm here for is to expose those issues and hopefully get law enforcement to work with us. And once you've covered the cases in Brownwood, what are your goals and hopes for the show after that? I have already spoken to several families that are outside of Brownwood that I have already interviewed and we are going to be pulling their cases out of the box in the basement and featuring them. Um, I have felt very close and connected with these family members because, again, I know exactly what they're going through. And it's very important to tell those cases that are 30 years old and have been completely forgotten by everyone except the family. And their voices aren't being heard. And so that's where I come in. And that's how I want to help. So I would love for you right now to mention a few things. First, how listeners can support your podcast. And then I'd also like you to give your contact information so anyone can reach out who may have advice for you in terms of support, expert advice, etc. So I have a website page for Leon, Justice for Leon Lorellis, and it is a page full of information about Leon, his case, all the podcasts we've been on, all the events we've held. There is also a submitted tip line that you can be anonymous with your tips. I also have a Facebook and Instagram page for Leon Lorellis and also for the podcast Box in the Basement. You can reach us through any of those ways. The podcast is found wherever you listen to podcasts. We do have a petition go out right now at change.org. Petition we have on change.org right now is to have Leon's case reviewed by Fresh Eyes and possibly have the FBI get involved, as well as having the body exhumed to have to for further analysis. And we'll link that in our show notes as well. Arlene, thank you so much for joining us again today. It's always an incredible pleasure for me to talk to you just because I, you know, on a personal level, adore you and love hearing about all the incredible work that you've done over the last few years, both for Leon's case and also for other cases. I think you've connected with so many incredible people out here in the community. Um, You've done an incredible amount of work for and with other people. And I hope that you're going to be able to find some folks out there who are able to support you as you work towards further answers in Leon's case. Thank you. And it's people like you, Laura, that have helped me to get this far. I don't think I'd be where I am without you today. You're the first person that contacted me, and I'm so grateful. I just love you to death. You're an amazing person. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Well, back at you. If you have any information regarding the murder of Leon Lorellis, please contact 325-305-6091 or justicetipsforleon at gmail.com. There is currently a $30,000 reward available in his case. You can visit the website justiceforleon.com for more information. And please, check out Arlene's podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. You'll find links for everything in our show notes. We'll be back in May with a new season covering a series of unsolved homicides and featuring the family members still seeking justice in their loved ones' cases. Thank you for listening. The Fall Line is an independent podcast, and we appreciate listener support. It allows us to do research, obtain FOIA, pay our content advisors, and support and donate to the causes we care about. If you try out the products we advertise, please, Use our sponsor codes. It really helps. 
And please take a moment to rate and review our show in your podcast app of choice. My book, Lay Them to Rest, which covers years of my life working on a Jane Doe case and the world of forensic scientists who resolve unidentified persons cases, is out everywhere now as a hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Read by me. You can order it anywhere you get books and through your local library. Find out more through the link in our show notes. And if you'd like to support the show and the stories we cover, join us on Patreon or Apple Premium. 100% of our Patreon and Apple Premium earnings are supporting our Family Therapy Fund and actively paying for therapy for families who've appeared on our show. On Patreon, you can get early release ad-free versions of our regular episodes for $5 a month. If you prefer Apple Premium, you can subscribe there as well. On Patreon, we also post occasional giveaways, updates, and blogs, which all patrons can enjoy, starting at just a dollar. The Fall Line is written, hosted, and researched by Laura Norton, with additional research assistance by Brian Warders. Interviews by Brooke Hargrove. Produced, engineered, and scored by Maura Curry. Content advisement by Brandy C. Williams and Vic Kennedy. And, as always, our most special thanks to Liz Lipka. <laughs>